Violence and insecurity are rampant in El Salvador, in Guatemala, uh, and especially in Honduras, the three countries where the lion's share of the children originate. Drug trafficking gangs control vast tracts of territory and fill the space left uh, by weak governments without the capacity to extend their authority and enforce the rule of law. The violence these gangs wreak is brutal and is indiscriminate. Children are disproportionately targeted as gangs work to draw them in, on, uh, in early on, controlling schools, recruiting middle school children as mules and traffickers, and threatening children and their families with violence, rape, and murder should they refuse to participate. This morning when uh, Senator Kane, I think, uh, at the hearing on the Senate, at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, asked uh, Secretary or Ambassador Shannon and Mr. Schwartz um, about the biggest problems, the things that are causing these children to come to you, the United States, they were unequivocal in their answer. And their answer was, the driver was violent. So as Ambassador Shannon argued, we cannot solve this problem alone. We need to build partnerships. And some of this has been echoed uh, by different leaders in, in Central America, in particular, I think the president of Honduras uh, and his foreign minister uh, called for broader US cooperation with Central American countries to address the insecurity and violence that fuels these migration patterns. In their statement, they referenced existing US partnerships that might serve as a working model for Central America, Merida Initiative, Plan Colombia. And they've said that these uh, programs have been incredibly uh, uh, useful and effective in reducing violence and insecurity. But they also said that Plan Colombia has driven violence northward and that the Merida Initiative drove violence south. Now, I don't agree completely with all of these things, but I think that there are uh, credible cases to be made that there is a, a, an effect to our effectiveness in these programs and a lack of, uh, I guess, coordination, maybe also a willingness, and I think Doug's going to talk a little bit about this, by governments in Central America to deal with some of these issues that are also part of this discussion. Uh, so now the U.S. is feeling the effects of this storm. U.S. financial support for counter-narcotics and security initiatives in South America could be better. The recent supplemental request isn't insignificant, but it's still uh, barely what is needed uh, to deal with the root causes of this issue. The fear that drives these young migrants makes the situation a unique one, and one arguably outside the realm of normal immigration policy. As Ambassador Shannon said this morning, this is a humanitarian crisis, not an immigration one. Perhaps the most compelling case for identifying, uh, identifying the crisis this way can be made by regional numbers. The migrants aren't just flooding into the United States. Throughout the entire region, asylum applications are up by about 400% as children pour out of Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala into Nicaragua, Panama, and Mexico as well. Countries we often view as sources of immigrants are becoming destinations as children seek refugee uh, uh, or, or seek refuge outside of their home communities. And there's a huge parallel between areas of violence and communities of origin. So dealing with the causes that drive these children northward is a humanitarian thing to do. And in reality, it's also the economic policy option as well. While dealing with the widespread violence and insecurity, or while dealing with it will not be cheap, it must be done. Throwing money at the border at improving immigrant enforcement will only delay the inevitable. It's part of the problem, sure it is, but we also need to think about the root causes of why these kids will continue coming. So with all that in mind, I'm gonna turn it over to Doug. Again, he is the authority on these issues. He'll be able to speak with, great, with a great deal of authority, uh, I'm sorry, with a great deal of knowledge and experience on these issues, particularly uh, on the very causes um, that uh, are making kids come to the United States. Uh, before he begins, I just want to remind you that we're all on the record today. We're being webcast. Uh, so after um, uh, Doug's remarks, and I'm going to ask him a couple of questions uh, as follow-ups, I'm going to open it up to, uh, to the audience for, for questions as well. Um, I would ask that you identify yourself, and uh, I understand that this is a very emotional issue for some people, and people are very passionate about this issue as well. I would ask that any comments be brief and that you get on with your questions. But without further ado, Doug, the floor is yours. 
Well, thank you very much. Yeah. And thank you, Carl, for that very uh, generous introduction and for your, your time to come and, and, uh, and listen to this. Uh, what I think I bring to the discussion that maybe is a little bit lacking is uh, spending a lot of time on the ground, particularly in very violent areas and in dealing with uh, gangs and others on a, on a fairly ongoing basis. And I think, you know, at heart, it really is a tremendously complex issue. And I, one of the things one has to have in mind going forward is that nothing in the short term is going to change the situation. There's nothing we can do or that there or the governments there can do or are willing to do that will significantly change the equation in people's minds. And I think you know, the, the question is why? Why is it that people are suddenly willing, and I don't think any parent, uh, any family lightly takes the decision to send their kids on a potentially lethal journey. That just doesn't happen, even if you're really not a good parent, <laughs> even if you're really not a, you know, a good relative, you don't do that lightly, and yet people are doing it by the, by the thousands. And I think a couple of years ago, I wrote a, uh, a long piece that caused uh, a lot of people some uh, unhappiness, where I argued that the rule of law, that the Central America Northern Triangle had essentially passed the tipping point. It had gone from being a functional but perhaps weak democratic systems in the Northern Triangle to systems that no longer functioned where that tipping point because of gang violence, because of government incompetence, because of massive corruption, but primarily because of the complete collapse of the rule of law, those countries no longer provided their citizens with any positive incentive to be identified with their own government, to view their government as capable of handling anything, to view the police forces as anything other than occupying forces and thugs, and therefore, you were going to see a series of consequences. I didn't, I was not smart enough to see the, the uh, Child exodus is one of them. <laughs> but I argued that you'd see ma much more migration, many other things coming out of this process, because people have simply reached the point where nothing works. And when nothing works, you begin to take desperate decisions. And when nothing works in this context, it means your life is at risk and those of the lives of your child is at risk. Uh, and particularly in, in the Northern Triangle, you see the entire rule of law hollowed out and justice largely become a transactional notion. Whoever can pay the most for whatever verdict they want in whatever case, regardless of right or wrong, will likely win that case. And when that happens and you have no recourse to the police, what, do you, what is the inevitable result that we see across the globe in other circumstances? People take justice into their own hands, violence sky, uh, skyrockets, the impunity rate in these countries uh, for homicides is above 95% in every country, which means if you want to kill somebody, your chances of getting caught are less than 5%, which is a good incentive to keep, to keep going, to do whatever you were going to do. And on top of that, you have the merging uh, issues that Carl mentioned, where you have Mexico pushing, Colombia pushing, and Central America sort of uh, caught in the middle. This has led to a series of, I think, really devastating consequences. The, one of them, the most obvious one that people talk about a lot, I think often without much knowledge, is the gang issue. The gangs are, have become uh, much more influential. I think the gangs three years ago had very little relationship with transnational organized crime and had very little relationship with uh, major drug cartels. I would argue that the vast majority still don't but that you have seen over time the ability of certain cliques, certain specific groups, particularly along the northern, uh, northwestern tier of El Salvador, to become much more uh, enchufado, much more plugged in to the local transportista networks. And what you see in San Pedro Sula, where I was last month in a really devastating sort of survey of, of the city, the gangs will tell you they're actually looking now for those relationships. They're actively pursuing the chance to hook up, particularly with the Sinaloa cartel. What does that entail? And I think if you, if you have that going on in a collapsed state where, there's no, where the rule of law no longer functions, repression, we had the mano dura, we had the mano super dura, uh, all of which failed miserably because none of the other issues were, uh, were addressed going, going with that, led in part to the gang truce, which I would argue in El Salvador when you had the truce signed two years ago, is probably the driving force of much of the instability and the rise in the gang violence you're seeing now because it was at that point through that process that the gangs understood they could exercise political power, they could make demands on the government, they could control large blocks of votes, they had politicians coming and courting them in the last elections, and so that changed the dynamic radically in how they viewed themselves and in their, in their uh, political environment uh, locally. And I think another thing that's this tremendously sort of depressing is you know if you follow the gangs at all, 
you know, your life in a gang is likely to be relatively short. You cycle in and out in a relatively short period of time, uh, which is one of the reasons why you can rise in the ranks of the gangs very quickly because there's job openings at the top often that come, come available in unexpected circumstances, and so your ability to, to move up the food chain is fast. But if you talk to the old gang members now, there's the lament that you hear of older generations everywhere. These kids just don't get it. You know, kids, they're, they're, they lost the ethos of the gang. They become much more violent. They don't respect the limits that the gangs traditionally had had. And this is largely because when I was with the, the gangs in San Pedro Sula, nobody I talked with was over 23 years old. They were, they were all, and they were exercising command structures. They weren't, uh, they weren't, in Salvador, you usually have them in their late 20s, early 30s. A lot of them have been in different places. San Pedro Sula, I think, is a very different animal. Uh, I think you have the amount of weapons that floats through there and the caliber of weapons they have uh, is enough to start another war. They use C4 to blow up each other's houses. It's a completely different dynamic than what you've seen elsewhere. And you have kids who really, you know, there's, there's, we've always said this about gangs. It's like, you know, they're going to live, uh, live hard, die fast, and, you know, they don't, it's not. I think it's, it, that's greatly accentuated in the new generation. They really don't have the expe expectation of living to be 25 which means that they feel like they can do pretty much anything in that time period. And it is true, and, you, and they, they'll talk about it, you know, they are recruiting younger and younger children, which if you live in a neighborhood and was particularly painful to listen to them talk about and to see the reality on the ground, is if you have a daughter, they will pick her up when she's 11 or 12 and gang rape her into the gang. That is the reality in vast sectors of San Pedro Sula and where gangs control. So if you're, if you're a parent, you're going to want to do something about that. You have two options. You know, they'll come to you and say, you know, we want your kid, uh, either your daughter or your son, in, or you pay us a lot of money, or we kill you. Those are the options that you get. And most of them don't have a lot of money. Most of them are the people, I, I talk to a lot of people who sneak out of the neighborhoods in the middle of the night. And what you're seeing is very similar to what you see, saw in Ciudad Juarez in the worst moment. We have huge neighborhoods now abandoned. People just leave their neighborhoods where they lived because they can't live there anymore. And you have this whole third emerging force, third or probably third, fourth, and fifth emerging forces in these areas now of people who call themselves antisociales. They claim to be anti-pandilla. They're all out of the pandillas. They wanna, they, but they claim to provide security in the neighborhoods. Uh, they, you know, they'll brag to you, oh, in our neighborhood, you can leave your car, and you know, if anybody comes, we'll, you know, we'll take care of it. That inevitably leads to vigilante killings, and things go to hell really fast, no matter how, what their intentions are. Uh, when, when they start out. And if in the, the, you know, the really shocking thing is that they, they really view, both the gangs enjoy it, but the civilians, they have no recourse. There's no one in the police they can go to. Particularly in San Pedro Sula, they'll tell you they can rent a police uniform and badge and gun for $400 a night, set up retenas, and what they want to do, like they want to kill somebody, they'll set up a reten where they know that person will come, they'll pick him up, and then they'll just hang around for a few hours to charge taxes to people who go by, rape people, pick them up. And I said, you know, why would anybody stop when they see it? They said, because they don't know if we're real cops. If the real cops would shoot them if they tried to run the Reten, and we'll shoot them too. So they can't tell the difference, right? It's just like, it's like this never, never land of, of, uh, of a black hole where, where people live, when, where the gangs are, are really strong. And on top of that sort of on the ground issues, you have the massive influence now of the transportista networks growing ever closer, particularly the Sinaloa cartel, having more money, which means more money to buy into the political system, more money to corrupt the political system, more money to collapse what little is left of the judicial systems, so that if you want to bring a charge, and the, and the gangs will tell you this, and every one of them that I talked to in the different cliques had a police commander that they could go to. He will give them what they want. But then the other clique will have someone else, and then the other gang will have someone else entirely. So, and one guy was saying, you know, <laughs> those, those damn MS-13 guys, you know, they have a colonel, and he does this and that, and, and, you know, he protects them, the police only protect them, they're always going after us. And he said, you know, my colonel just got transferred. You know, this is really <laughs> bad, I don't know what we're going to do, but he didn't see the irony of wow. <laughs> having one of his own while he was complaining about what, other, what the other groups uh, uh, were doing. And I think the... the uh, is it, in that mix, you have increasing resources flowing in, which is the other thing I think is the, one of the main drivers. You're no longer talking about kids who are making, I think I've, I've told Carl the story before, when I first started doing the gang truce uh, stuff in 2012, I was seeing out the leadership, you know, the gang in prison, and we were saying, you know, so I said, how much do you charge 
to, to guard a load across the northern tier there from point A to point B. And they thought really hard, and they were really pleased with them. They said, we charge $600. Like, that was the biggest number they could think of. <laughs> they now realize they could charge 6000 or 60000 or 600000 That orders the magnitude of the resources flowing in and their ability to think in much different ways and much more uh, broadly and recognize the, the value of what they can provide and what they do is grown astronomically, which means they have more resources. At the same time, the states have been, I think, remarkably uh, incompetent in dealing with this over a period of years. There is a constant lament, and I think it's true that there is a lack of resources, the government's under-resourced. I would argue that if half of the corruption were stopped, they would have resources to do an enormous amount, and if they had the political will and if they were thinking about it. Uh, in my experience, the general tendency is to think that this is all the problem of the United States. Uh, you've seen, as far as I can tell, in the northern tier, nothing at a governmental level of any of the three governments to actually try to begin to address this issue in their own way with root causes. So yes, I think it's very easy to say, and I think there's, and there's a lot of truth in it, that this is largely, this is a U.S. problem, without a doubt. We have, there's co-responsibility, there are all those things. But if you're not willing to take the resources that are being siphoned out of your coffers by the most extraordinary amounts. I mean, you, you read the amounts of money that the Funes government in El Salvador walked out the door with. Unbelievable, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay, you could take a fraction of that, reinvest it in your own country, and, be, and I think you know, Honduras went through a really dark period. It may be pulling out a little bit now. Guatemala was bad enough so that they accepted international oversight, the CICIG, to come in and, and deal with their cases because they were simply unable to prosecute their own their own people, that's all sort of dissipated as well. So I think, yes, it's a co-responsibility, co but I think that the, the countries themselves have to view the, the, the fact that their children are, and their people are taking these enormous risks to leave as a problem for them too. I think it's probably the worst indictment a government can have when your people want to walk out the door in tremendously risky circumstances across the desert and view that as preferable to living in the country you govern in, which is supposed to be a, a democracy. I think that should set off some alarm bells and make you think, okay, what the hell has happened here? Why are we in this situation? I, I cannot tell if those alarm bells are going off. So I think the overall situation, if you've read and followed any of my stuff on Central America, you can tell I'm a bit of a pessimist. <laughs> I, don't see, I don't see many lights at the end of the tunnel, and I think that some of the worst assumptions that I and some other folks made about the direction things were going have uh, sadly turned out to be true and probably understated in some cases. And I think, you know, I think the, the new government in El Salvador has a chance to do new and different things. I think the, they are reforming, bringing back the better police that, that the Funes government the administration had kicked out. They're doing some things in their internal intelligence structures, some things I think with a lot better people, uh, a lot less corruption at, at the cupola, at least the upper levels of the police in intelligence, which I think will be very beneficial or could be very beneficial if there's political will to, to back them. But I think that if you, if, you know, on the ground there for, especially in the neighborhoods where their kids, where these kids live. I mean, one of the guys I was talking to in, in Honduras is, uh, you know, one of the well-known hitmen there, and when he and he told me he sent his kids out of the country uh, to go to Belize. He didn't send them to the U.S. Sent to Belize to, and I was like, so the top hitman can't protect his own kids. You have a serious problem, right? This is like, uh, this is like Never Never Land. Um, so I think that when we look at this. And the idea of what the U.S. should do, and I'm not a, I'm not a policy person, I think it, the only comment I would make, if you, we've, we have done CARSI for the last few years. We put in 200 and some odd million into the, that process. By every statistical measure, the situation in the region in the Northern Triangle is worse than when we started. Homicides are up, impunity rates are up, kidnappings are up, child migration is certainly up. All of the, uh, the prison population, overpopulation are all up. So I think if, the, uh, if we want to talk about putting more resources into the region, one has to sit back and fundamentally rethink what we're doing. If we're if doing, putting more into the same things that have produced at best nothing and at, at, at worst uh, negative results, you might want to rethink what you're actually doing and where that aid is going. And I think one of the huge problems that we face in the region is very difficult in the current political configurations to find interlocutors that you can trust and in, in, in work with in vetted units and that sort of thing. I think we've had a lot of really bad experience over time and recently with, 
work in vetted units. Honduras may be turning the corner a bit on that. Um, so there, there's, no, there's no easy solution because in, it, the countries essentially have to have the political will to begin turning around the situation internally so that other aid can actually be meaningful as, as it flows in. And I think on the gang issue, one has to fundamentally rethink. I mean, I, people uh, came to think I was uh, radically anti-truce in my, in my thinking. Uh, and it's actually not true. I, I think that everything else has failed. I think my problem with the truce in El Salvador was the way it was done, totally non-transparent negotiating with narcos behind it. That, I think, is not a, not a valid model for what you want to do, and I think the results are evident. But I think we do have to be willing to fundamentally rethink. Maybe a truce or incorporation of di different things has to happen with gangs that now exercise real political power and may be able to be brought into a system in a different way. I think that we have to start with the fundamental recognition that everything else has failed. Everything we've done has, has failed. So what does that mean? It means you have to radically rethink. And I'll, set, I'll just finish uh, my side of this by saying one thing I see is tremendously dangerous. Uh, and that is the, the great split in pre perceived priorities between the United States and our policy and what people on the ground there want to see. Our primary policy is still focused on counter-narcotics and stemming the flow of illicit drugs into this country. Their primary violence and the driving force of what any rational politician down there is doing is to lessen the violence. And those two are not particularly compatible. And at this point, I think that if you, if you look at how some of the Central American responses have been, they seem irrational, where they, where they really piss off policymakers. It's stupid. If you look at it from their point of view, they need to get the violence down. And it's going to probably be in ways that we, a lot of people in Washington will not particularly like. And I think you have to have room in, we have to have room in our heads to acknowledge these are rational responses to really dire and uh, unsettling circumstances that may require us to fundamentally rethink. And we have to find a way to have some overlap between what our national agenda in the region is and what their driving political imperatives are. And right now, there's almost no overlap, which is why they're increasingly willing to tell us to just take a hike, because we are no longer looking at the same set problem set uh, as being a priority. So I'll leave it there and uh, take it away. Great. Well, th thanks, Doug, for that uh, set of really comprehensive uh, remarks. Uh, I'm going to ask you to drill down on a couple things. One is you mentioned the willingness of countries in the region to work with us on different issues, violence or security. Um, you've had experience with this in Plan Colombia, and I'm assuming some as well on, on the Merida Initiative. Could you describe a little bit what that willingness looks like? Uh, I think it's important to sort of give an example to countries in the region so they understand when we mean willingness and uh, cooperative uh, solutions going forward, what does it look like? So can you tell me a little bit about what that experience is like with Colombia? Well, I, I guess in my mind, the thing that fundamentally changed Colombia in terms of the visible political will was when they decided to begin taxing their own people to pay for their own war. One of the things that in the study that Carl and I did uh, last year, earlier this year, yeah. um, in doing the research, that was what was shocking to me was that at no point in Plan Colombia did U.S. military aid cover more than 24% of the Colombian military budget and is now down to about 4%, which means what? It means the Colombians assumed the responsibility in ways that were very painful and it involved you know, really rich people who had never paid taxes, who didn't want to pay taxes, starting to pay taxes. And it meant ultimately that they had a sustainable model for a long period of time that allowed them to carry out a a series of events over more than a decade in what you're now seeing the result of. I think if you look at the taxation rates, I don't remember what they are off the top of my head any anymore, but Central America has the lowest taxation rates in the world. I think Guatemala particularly, specifically uh, derives something below 20% of its revenues from taxes. It's impossible to run a country like that, and you can't really expect the outside world to keep putting in money when, you're, when you don't assume the, that responsibility on your own. So I think that that would be one of the key things. The other thing I think that they were willing to do at great cost internally was really purge the, the police and military and, and corruption. They were fortunate to have a series of uh, very good leaders in the, in the police who they gave extraordinary powers to who were able to weed out. I think uh, Naranjo got rid of at one time 2,500 mm -hmm. folks. 
he didn't have to explain it, purely on suspicion of corruption, because you looked at their income, you looked at how they lived, and you said, okay, this can't possibly be, goodbye. They didn't have to prove it in a court of law, which allowed for a fairly, and fortunately they had responsible people doing this without a lot of personal vendettas and other things going on. But I think the willingness to build a professional force, and they were tremendously concerned as they went forward about the state providing positive state services. What do you have in Central America? There's virtually no positive state presence. If the state is there, it terrifies people often, more often than, than they're viewed as, as beneficial. I think Colombia has done an enormous amount in changing that dynamic of how, they're perce how the state itself and how the repressive apparatus of the state is perceived by people and the ability, not in, certainly not across the board, and there are multiple problems without a doubt. But I think that is, they've come a tremendously long way in 10 years, which I would argue that, and, and a judicial system that has recovered a significant degree of credibility. Second, last question. I think a lot of folks will, will want to chime in here and have questions. Um, broadly speaking, uh, when you look at transnational crime, you see the movement of goods and people and extortion. Uh, you see that all by land, by ocean, by air. Um, is there a portion here that needs to be improved on the SOUTHCOM side? Uh, do we need more assets, uh, maritime assets? Do we need to figure a new approach to dealing with the movement of people and things and goods that are coming out of Central America to other parts of the region? Well, I think you know, the, the testimony of uh, General Kelly, his posture statement earlier this year, I thought was an extraordinary posture statement for a combatant commander which was that essentially they can watch a whole lot of things and can act on a tiny fraction of them. You know, they, they can watch the cocaine go by, they can listen to Farsi on ships going through the Caribbean and, and, uh, and have no idea what's being said and have no, no capacity to stop the, the, so they have to pick their targets very, very carefully and they have less and less cooperation. And I mean, I, I was talking with a, with a narco a year, more than a year ago in Honduras, when I was doing the piece on had we reached a tipping point, this is one of the things that convinced me that, that we, we had. Um, I said to this guy, I said, I, my sense is that something is different in Central America now. It's no longer what it was, that something's changed. You guys are doing a lot better. And he laughed. He said, you're right, something has changed. And I said, what? He said, we're no longer afraid of the United States. He said, we know they're not going to do anything. And that has opened the doors for us, you know, they, they, the, the feeling, even though I think it's not entirely true, and I think DEA and others have done a lot of really interesting things in, in Honduras and elsewhere, but our absence, I think, on the, on the ability to provi provide resources, the, the lack of ability of who to give it to if we did have resources, and the inability to act on the vast majority of stuff we do see going by is, is a encouraging factor for the transnational organized crime groups as they move through there because they simply feel like there's no goalie in the goal. You know, they're just metiendo goles. Yeah, there's no reaction. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions um, from folks uh, here in the audience. Uh, we could just get a microphone up here in front, just quickly, right here. Thanks. Uh, Diana Negroponte from the Wilson Center. Two questions, one for Doug and one for our policy man. Doug, you have been, your authority has been taken away by our moderator, but I'm about to give it back to you. <laughs> you are an authority on gangs, on illicit organizations. I want to ask you, what is the role of the private sector in Central America, in the northern part, in reintegrating these men and women, children as they come back? For the policy man with authority, were the United Nations to declare the northern triangle a refugee situation, what would be the implications for the US government in applying standard refugee processes for dealing with the children and their mothers? Uh, I think the, the private sector question is, is, I think, tremendously important. And, and that's something I, I skipped over unintentionally. Um, I, I think that you know, they have been incredibly reluctant uh, to either pay taxes or reincorporate and create job opportunities for people even when they're, when they're looking for them. And it's not, it's not an easy question, I, and I understand that for them, but if you ask, you know, I was talking to some businessmen that I've known for a long time in El Salvador, said, how much do you spend on private security, their own selves? You know, 35, 40, 50 million, thousand dollars a year. So, you know, if you could pay $10,000 in taxes and create a viable police force, you wouldn't have to do that, right? You could actually save money. But if you look at the statistics on 
the private security forces versus police forces in the three country across the region. Uh, it varies from country to country. There's about double private sector, private police force, if, if not more. Um, so I think that they're, you know, they're, they're caught, I think, in fairness to them, in a situation where they feel paying taxes goes to corruption. Uh, but they've never paid taxes, and they've never shown any, any willingness to. And they think, well, if we pay now, it's just going to get stolen, which there's some truth to that. But you can also take measures to improve governance as you pay, as you pay taxes. Um, one guy told me it, wasn't, it was in 2012 that the total private sector job creation in El Salvador had been 1,000 jobs. And I was like, 1,000 jobs? I mean, other, there are the public sector and most of the informal sector, but formal jobs that they had created, which is abysmal and unforgivable. And I think that one of the things that, that uh, you see is a willingness of the really wealthy in, in, uh, to just simply leave the country again. They did it during the wars, and they, and they do it now, and as opposed to uh, Getting down in the weeds and trying to actually solve the problem with some risk to themselves in their in, in their resources. But there's another huge problem, and that is that the narcos in the region are at the point now where they have so much money that they need to start investing in legitimate businesses. And what you see across the region, but particularly the Northern Triangle, is as the narcos come in, they can undercut any legitimate business by a significant uh, amount because they don't care if they make money on their businesses, right? They're there to launder money. So if you have a 6% profit margin and someone can sell the same product at 20% less and you know that they're taking a loss but they don't care, that puts you out of business. And you see in droves private sector people being put out of business by narco businesses coming in to directly compete with them in ways that we would consider to be uh, not legitimate competition. But if you have a million dollars and you only need 800,000 back to make your, you know, to make what you want out of it, you can put a lot of businesses out of business and that's happening. So they're, they're shrinking and they're in a very difficult situation. In re regarding your question, um, right. The, what was interesting about today's hearing on this, at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is that you, you had very few members of Congress talking about this issue uh, as a humanitarian issue. It was more dealing with the immediate concern, which was the border. Why do I say this? Because I think there is a view from folks towards this issue to look at it more as a security issue and as a sort of quasi-immigration issue, when in reality, a lot of this has to do with migration. A lot of this has to do with some fallout from policies that we've had we need to be more comprehensive in how we deal with this. I think that having a body like the UN uh, for political issues might affect some folks across the aisle in one way and another group of folks in another way. Folks look at the UN in different ways. Some reject it and some embrace it more. So there's that added sort of uh, side to it. But more than anything and more importantly, I think that it might force people here to reevaluate a little bit what our policies have been and it might force a more, a, a broader conversation on how to deal with some of these issues. It, we no longer can sort of stand aside and see, have the kind of participation that we have with Southcom, where we're just watching things happen. That, that, that can't happen. That's one issue. The other issue is that the core issues that are making these children come are issues that uh, affect us directly, security-wise, directly, economically, but also voting. And this is one of these issues that's what I call intermestic, because a lot of the people that are in this country who have family members that are affected are looking at public officials and looking at how they're reacting to these issues, and it affects their votes. So this issue in particular has angles all over the place, and I don't know if the UN issue would actually make people react more, but I do think that more and more more uh, members uh, and more decision makers are starting to look at how broad this issue truly is. Let me just get a microphone. Sergio de la Peña, independent consultant. Um, it's a great, great uh, brief and uh, obviously have a pretty broad depth of the subject matter. Could you address what it is that is unique and the spikes that you've had of the migration flows, because obviously there's been violence in that region for a long time. During the civil wars, where more people were getting killed, there wasn't this massive flow going through. Now, you also have the involvement of the Mexican government that 
by some reports say that Peña Nieto has allowed migrants from Central America to get through Mexico within 72 hours. And that's, that may be what's generating this, but what is it that's unique about the tremendous spike that's happened in the last six months? Because the numbers have trebled, quadrupled. Yeah. Um, I think that, well, one, I, I think that there are a lot more people being, being killed now than there were in the war. I think that that's, it's, that's one of the saddest things about the region is that the war has actually looked back in many cases as a good time, as a better time than what they're living, and I think that's, that's one of the tragedies of the region. I think the spike was driven by several things. One is that it was, um, uh, I think the gangs have become more violent, and as they've, they've pushed down the people's ability to absorb or, or tolerate this kind of violence has has snapped, they sort of reached a, just a mental breaking point. And there's no question that the coyotes are putting out the word to get your kids. You know, now's the time to send your kids. You can do it. That, without a doubt, that, that was, a, and it is, you know, you well know that a lot of those, when, especially when you're dealing in societies that, that run on rumors and, and what people say, and, and, uh, and especially when a lot of folks are getting through initially, it fed the idea that, that the coyotes were more than willing, because they're making a lot of money in the process, uh, that, that they that that was a they were that was the, one of the push factors. There was this idea that, oh my God, now you can do it. And they were they were flat out lying to people. And people are saying, well, okay, if this is the time, I can scrape the money together, uh, off we go. But I don't think that the same rumors a year before would have had the same effect. Primarily because uh, you have now uh, gangs that show up with you know, AK-47 assault rifles, they show up with light anti-tank weapons, they show up uh, with all kinds of things. And, and the, the, the level and impact as they've spread their control and their, and their ability to act across the country, it also affects more and more people. So I think something snapped in, in a lot of people, that they, they've, they finally reached the conclusion that there was no hope in their own country. And I think it's, it's, it's culmination of a series of other events uh, or different events that sort of all came together, in part ignited by people saying, it's really bad here, you can get your kid out. And then everybody said, okay. And then once it starts, then people just keep going for a while. Um, and I think once it stops, it'll stop a bit. But, uh, but I think that, that that's my take on what sort of spike, sparked this. I think we have a Twitter question. Do you have your microphone? If you can come a little closer so people can hear and see. Sure. Uh, this was in response to your comments about the um, buy-in from the Colombian government and the need for Central American governments to do the same. One of our followers asked, but where is the line between unwillingness and lack of capacity for enforcement on the part of Central American governments? Well, I think, you know, if you look at the, the great hope after the Civil Wars was what, and I spent a lot of time there during this time, it was the new police forces that were emerging, right? So Salvador had this great idea, which is one-third former combatientes of the FMLN, one-third former security forces, and one-third new folks who were uh, at least high school education and good wages and all that stuff. Um, ultimately, that didn't work out so well. And in fact, it went, it went south very quickly, and it took a lot of us, myself included, a long time to figure out that it had gone south and why. And one of the primary reasons was because the groups that were recruited primarily from the, the FMLN sector and from the former police uh, security force sector immediately began reporting out to their, pri their previous bosses in their, in their previous structures. They had no loyalty to the institution. So very quickly, everyone had intelligence except the government. And the police intelligence units were the least well informed because all the stuff was being sent out outside. So you were able to maintain, as we've seen in the FMLN particularly, now you had a series of clandestine structures that just simply never, never disappeared and are now quite strong and active. And the same thing happened on the far right, where you had a lot of groups that, that maintained their kidnapping capacity, their money moving capacity, et cetera. Um, so I think that, I think that it's, a, it's a tremendously difficult line to draw between what, within capacity, I mean, there has been capacity, and in every country there are really good cops. Without a doubt, there are really good cops who risk an enormous amount every day, and in every country they're a shrinking minority. I think what you saw that the Funes government did in its last year in office, which is decapitate the entire, I would say, the best of the, of the police structures uh, for all the wrong reasons, which is now being repaired a bit by the, by the sanchez Serin government, uh, was indicative of the risk that really good quality people face when they try to do their jobs. Um, so I think it's, it's, a dual, it's a dual challenge. You have to have 
people that you can work with and they have to be willing to work with you and you have to put the resources in once you have that establishment. I think one of the things that, uh, that Plan Colombia did pretty well was the Colombians were pretty generally, I mean, they wanted some really high tech stuff and we gave them some high tech stuff, but they built their core capacity on stuff that they could sustain. That's why they bought Brazilian Tucans and other things, uh, aircraft that were much easier to maintain. They could keep them within, with that within their budget. They didn't want this pie in the sky, uh, sky stuff that would, they were unable to maintain when, as the US began uh, drawing down. And I think that uh, all of those things played into success there and none of those factors are present in Central America at this time. Questions, um, why don't we go with Ambassador Maisto. Uh, John Maisto, retired US diplomat. Uh, Doug, you indicated that CARSI, 200 million over the past several years, has been a failure. I think, is that a fair? What was the last part? Uh, that CARSI has been a, the, our, the, the policy of the administration in Central America, particularly in the Northern uh, Triangle, has been a failure because you end up with something that is not different from where you started. As a matter of fact, it's worse. Yeah. Um, could you dig into that a little bit? Uh, my question would be, is the essential thrust of the thinking behind CARSI, which has to do with institutional strengthening and, and, uh, and, and, and sharing uh, intelligence, uh, et cetera, uh, is that a good way to go forward? Or should we just throw that out the window in favor of something else? And it, if it's something else, then what? <laughs> The, the, I don't know what the something else is. Um, I think on paper, Carsey made a lot of sense. I think that if you look at a region where you, which taken together is the size of a mid-sized state and you have seven countries in there, the idea of trying to work with them together as a unit as opposed to each country trying to do its own thing makes a lot of sense. Uh, the reality is that the countries don't talk to each other and they don't trust each other. If you ask, you know, I ask cops all the time in any country, if you know that you're, you know, you're pursuing this guy in El Salvador and he goes to Honduras, who would you call in Honduras? And they all say, I have no idea. Don't know anybody over there, don't <laughs> trust them. I, I, you know, like, it's, it's over. So if, if something happens, it's largely because the, the US or Interpol mediates the contacts that, that go around there. So I think that, I, so I don't think it was, it was stupid. I think it was a very rational way of looking at it in a set of circumstances that did not turn out to be, I think the divisions were much bigger across countries than made it, uh, than, than was anticipated. And I think that the institutions themselves fairly quickly uh, stopped providing what they were supposed to be providing and became sort of forums for everyone to get together, travel, let's go to Guatemala for the weekend, have a Carsey meeting, yay. Uh, and and there, there was very little uh, ability to, to bring that together in, in a way that, that would make uh, a significant difference. So I think, yes, one has to rethink it. What that rethinking leads to, that's why we have Carl and people, because I don't, uh, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't see myself a better model. I, but it's, I think it's, it's very clear to me that the current models are, are really not functioning. And there are, I mean, we've talked about creating vetted units, joint vetted units. There are all kinds of authorization problems with that, legal problems on our end to be able to create truly functional uh, vetted units that would be multinational on their end, et cetera. So it's, it's complicated, uh, but I think something has to change, yes. And, and maybe it's not just the model, but it's commitment to the model. And if you look at funding for CARSI over the years, it's decreased. Um, so it, it might not be ha the necessity or, or having to reinvent the wheel as much as really being committed to keeping the funding, keeping a commitment and attention to these, certain, to these issues. And you know from your experience and lots of other folks that are former government people that it's hard to keep interest and commitment in Washington. It's just difficult. Uh, a lot, for instance, uh, I mean, a lot, I, I fear, and, and, and this is just part of just the situation that we're in. For instance, there's a tremendous tragedy today with the uh, Malaysian Airlines plane that was shot out of the sky by the Russians, allegedly, is what they're saying, right? So all of the attention now is going to be redirected to dealing with these issues. And there's been a lot of activity on the side uh, in the Congress and the executive branch with the issue of immigration. Well, I wonder, is all the attention now going to go to deal with something else? Uh, so, you know, it's, it's that consistent uh, attention, involvement, uh, a couple of champions in the Congress, you know how this works, Ambassador Maisto, that are consistently working on an issue, consistently asking for uh, fine-tuning, 
of a policy and consistently ensuring that it receives the funding that's necessary for it to be successful. So I think there's a question up here. Thank you, um, Margaret Hayes, uh, at Georgetown now. Um, what it, I have a concern uh, that we up here don't have a very good, really good picture and understanding of this whole question of violence and opportunity and, and so forth. You've talked a lot about San Pedro Sula, um, which if I understand is the most violent place in Honduras and, and so forth. In the world. In, right now. <laughs> yeah, in, uh, in Honduras, the most violent place in the world. Um, as you travel through these Northern Triangle countries, do you find violence localized mm -hmm. or do you, do you see the whole country em, embroiled? And um, could you add on to that a comment on the rest of the region, uh, Nicaragua, Costa Rica? Are, are we seeing some of this phenomenon uh, move south at, at all? I, I think the, the first question is actually really important because it is, I would say, uh, particularly in Honduras, fairly focalized. There's no, the, the, the country is not on fire. If you look at the, the UN did a really good report on transnational organized crime in Central America, I think, end of 2011 or 2012. And they had some great maps in there where you can, where they show the red, you know, and it, it hits the borders. If you know drug trafficking routes, it follows the drug trafficking routes, it follows the borders. And, the, and when I was asking the gang folks, why are you doing, what's happening now in San Pedro? Why is it, why is it suddenly this other the spike in violence here? And they said, because it's, it's, we're fighting for plazas, we're, you know, this is, we're looking for space. Um, and the, I mean, the, the simple, the mathematics of it, which I think is one of the things we don't factor in very much, one of the things, the innovation of the Mexicans in cocaine trafficking was starting to pay in kind. The Colombians never paid in kind, they paid in cash. So when you pay in kind, you have to create an internal market. If they pay me a kilo of cocaine, I have to get someone to buy that. Internally, I can't go to Miami with a kilo of cocaine. So you create these internal, these internal dynamics of consumption and violence. And if you're paying 10 people a kilo of cocaine and there are three esquinas, plazas, where you can fight, seven people are gonna die. That's the math of it. They, they're simply, there's, that's the way it works. And you saw this in, in Ciudad Juarez. You see this, when you see these spirals of violence, it's almost always over. And what's happening now is the, the cartels are paying, they're, they're looking, they're moving a lot more product through there, they're paying a lot more out, and so you have this tremendous violence surrounding who gets to sell that and who's gonna make money internally. And, and you also see, unfortunately, the the consumption level skyrocketing in, the, in these countries. Um, I think that if you look at maps, you know, you have, in San Pedro Sula, you have 80% uh, of the gangs in Honduras are in San Pedro Sula. In El Salvador, you look at the map and they cover the entire country. Um, so I think there, but the, there it's also, it's not equal across the board there either. You have certain clicas, particularly where the traffickers need. I mean, the, the, the power of the gangs derives from their control of territory. So if you're a narco and you don't need that territory, you're not gonna go look for gangs. You don't like to deal with them. They're not nice people, they're not reliable. So if you live someplace in the backside of Chatnango and you're MS-13, good for you, but you're not gonna get anything because no one's gonna go through there because they don't need you. Where, you, where they're most violent and where they're most uh, connected to the transportistas and, and up, is in the areas that those guys that those guys need, so they have to negotiate with them because ter territorial control. So yes, when when those factors are absent, the violence is much less. Um, I think the question about Nicaragua and Costa Rica are interesting. I think that uh, what you see in Nicaragua, when I was there, I was shocked. You know, it was always sort of the backwater of Central America. It has more, the flights are packed, businessmen are flooding in there. Why? Because they don't face any of the obstacles that they face in the Northern Triangle. I think there are a series of reasons for that, some good and some bad, uh, that have allowed Nicaragua to, to pursue this, this route. I think that they are, their internal security apparatus is such that you're not gonna see a great expansion of that in there. I think Costa Rica is much more a danger. Uh, they're a much more democratic society with, uh, that play by different rules, and I think that they're in risk of being eaten alive. Um, but, uh, but I think that, so, but I think that the gangs are now in sort of, as they say in El Salvador, it's not an otra onda. They're thinking about other things right now. They're not particularly thinking pushing south. They're thinking particularly in recreating themselves as a trans-regional structure that will be new, different, and much more dangerous. And after that, they may again think about their expansion elsewhere. 
gentleman right here in the middle. You can get the microphone right here. Ian, I mean, you can, right here, he's standing right here. <laughs> there you go. Thanks. Matthew Ostrander with the National Conference of State Legislatures. Uh, last week I was at the appropriations hearing where Se uh, Secretary Johnson of the Department of Homeland Security uh, hailed the U.S. foreign policy effort saying that they had even worked with the First Lady of Guatemala to begin a television campaign telling uh, the children to stay home. Do you think that's the kind of foreign policy effort that's one effective and if not or if so, either way, uh, what additional efforts could the Department of Homeland Security or other foreign policy organizations within the United States apparatus make in the coming weeks? The coming weeks is very difficult. I mean, I think it's, it's good to put out the word. I think, you know, the governments don't, none of, well, except maybe because it's a new government, El Salvador has some credibility. I don't think that what the governments say, I think really have that much weight anymore. I think one of the tragedies of Central America or the Northern Triangle is that the state is often not the most important actor in society any longer. They are no longer, you know, you have multiple other actors who exercise a lot more influence and people pay a lot more attention to uh, than the government. And that's not the way uh, in the Westphalian system our state should work. But, it, but I think there are increasing areas of the country where the, where the state is entirely absent and others where they're, they're viewed as entirely predatory. Um, so. Does it help? Certainly. And I think that the idea, but I, I think it'd be much more effective if there were outreach campaigns that went much deeper in their communities to talk to people about the dangers. But I mean, and even that is silly because people know the dangers. I mean, you know, it's not nobody, after the years of immigration, people have a pretty good idea of what it takes to get across our border and the, and the hardships and that, it, you know, an eight-year-old should not be doing it on their own, if, if at all. Um, so I'm, I think that it, it, the messaging is probably somewhat important, but I would say it's not going to carry a great deal of weight down there. And what you said earlier, which is imagine how bad the situation is that you have parents right. that are giving this as an option to their kids. Last question. Um, there's like one, two, three. Um, why don't we do this? Why don't I just take them from you and you decide which one you want to, you want to answer. So why don't we do one, two, and three. And um, get the microphone here. The, uh, the lady here, the gentleman there who has a microphone, and the woman in the back there. So, um, Doug, I've actually read your book on um, Merchant of Death. Remember that book? <laughs> So I was wondering if you could talk about the extent to which uh, American weapons are fueling the violence in Latin America, because I know this has been talked a lot about in Mexico. I don't know if there's a trickle-down effect from Mexico to you know, El Salvador or so on. But I was wondering if you could talk about whether that's a policy issue we need to consider. Okay, the lady up front here. We're just going to get all three. All oh, right, let me, let me wait, because we they have. Thank you, Valerie Varela with USAID. Um, so my question is in terms of capacity building and the rule of law, um, what is the international community doing in terms of um, in the history and also currently or planning um, on helping build the capacity on rule of law and democracy in the area? And the lady in the back there, Ian. <coughs> Thanks. Stefania Sfera, Georgetown University. Um, Mr. Farah, I was surprised to the, by the allusion to the Merida Initiative and the Plan Colombia, because I'm Mexican myself, and I don't personally believe that Mexico can be seen as an example in terms of human rights. Um, mainly, if we consider the, the human rights violation escalating after the militarization of the conflict, or even when we're dealing with our victims, which we don't even know how many victims we're talking about, because we can say 60, 80, 100,000 victims. We don't have a national registry. So I know, um, and also if we consider the, the problem that we have with immigrants coming from Central America, we have mass graves in Mexico. And uh, when you deal with regions as Michoacán or Tamaulipas, I, I, don't, I don't personally believe we can consider ourselves a, uh, a model region in any way. But um, so, so my question, question is, yes, um, you mentioned you, you were not a, a policymaker nor anything, but if we were to consider um, diversifying um, the um, where we're if the U.S. were to consider providing funds to other regions beyond the militarization, where what could we think of in terms of development, education, or other options for the funding? Well, well, first I never I wasn't talking about Merida at all. I was talking about Carsi. I never said Merida and Mexico were a model of of anything. The, 
And I was talking about that. Well, that was that, well, what anyway. I, that, let's yeah, leave that. Yeah. But I, I was yeah. not referring to Mexico as, as a model in the in yeah. certainly not in, in terms of of, uh, of human rights and how they've executed what they're doing. Um, on the weapons issue, I think that that's tremendously important. I think that what, unfortunately, I mean, yes, weapons come from the United States without a doubt. Um, but what you're seeing it, right now in Central America is much more uh, other fact, other coming from other places. You have a lot of weapons uh, flowing in now from Colombia as parts of the FARC demobilized. You see a lot of AKs. You see a lot of all kinds of stuff flowing through there. So I think that I think it's a, it's a mix, which is even worse than just having a source country because it means you have multiple source countries plus, you know. Uh, uh, caches of weapons that are left over from the wars, which don't work very well, but they're still around, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I think it's a very calm, I think it's a driving force, the, the, the ability to acquire uh, weapons of war, uh, assault rifles, and laws in C4 is really damaging, and certainly the, a chunk of that comes from the United States, without a doubt. Um, the other question was uh, the web, uh, capacity building. Um, that was good. Oh, what, what, was, oh, what could AID do? Was that the question? Um, the international, community. international community. I think there are a lot of models out there. I think the fundamental lacking ingredient is n having governments that there's sort of a minimal level of trust with that you can begin building those things. If you have that, I think that you can see really good work that was done in, in West Africa in post-war in post situations. Liberia and Sierra Leone, I think, have done you know, really interesting. I think Colombia and their post-war, their, their efforts to reestablish state presence after 400 years of absence uh, have some really interesting models. I think they're out there. I think the, the question is having a solid enough foundation to begin to implement, uh, implement those on. And then your, the second part of your question uh, that wasn't met either was, uh, other types of aid. I think you know. I think that AID and others, uh, the European Community, have done some really effective things. I think that uh, in, in other parts of the world, I think again, the, the internal decomposition of the Northern Triangle is such that it's very difficult to find. I, I don't. Th I don't think we're lacking for models or ways to do things particularly. I think that they they exist. I think you know. It's it's clear that uh, rule of law teachings in in schools and some other programs that have been run through the State Department have been very effective in changing how people view it. I think the way the, the uh, mayor of uh, Bogota, the crazy mayor Mokus, uh, did his civic campaigns and sort of changed the civic culture of Bogota by a whole series of very creative ways, which I thought when I was living there were, were the stupidest things I ever thought. I was like, this, is, this guy is crazy. It, it worked. I mean, it was an amazing thing. So I think there are multiple, I think Medellin in their post uh, San Pedro Sula type period uh, came up some really creative, innov innovative ways. So I think that there are multiple ways out if you have a sufficient foundation to begin moving forward, which I would argue is, is what's lacking at this point. Great. Well, with that, I want to thank you. Thank you. You've been wonderful. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's come and the folks that are watching. We've addressed, I think, the need to uh, deal with the root causes of this issue. I think in, in some Detail, of course, we could also always do more. Always. <laughs> but I think we've done a pretty adequate job. So well, thank, thank you very you. much, Doug.